Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Leslie Milano. I'm the president of the Women's Democratic Club, and we have a really exciting guest speaker today. We're very happy to have Jennifer Rubin here, author, columnist, and commentator. And she's going to talk about her new book, Resistance, How Women Save Democracy from Donald Trump. I've been reading her uh, opinions pieces uh, lately, and they, um, I'm just so excited to ask you many questions as well. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today. A Little bit about WDC for everyone here. Let me tell you uh, for about, Oh, for over 60 years, WDC has been a vibrant network of politically active women and men. We are active on the local, state, and national levels, advocating for the increased role of women in our democracy, championing issues that are important to women, and working to keep all of our members of our society engaged and informed. And we want you to join us as well. So please, if you haven't renewed, please join WDC. We have many committees that you can be a part of as well. We actually have some additional um, roles in our executive team. One ex uh, in particular, we're looking for a secretary. Um, so if you have been an, an active member of WBC and might be interested in that role, let us know. Um, you can contact us about uh, being part of WBC at our website, which is here at the bottom, womensdemocraticclub.org. We have an exciting speaker series, and that's just one of the ways that we accomplish our goals. Uh, past speakers are listed here. We just had Representative John Sarbanes, and um, we have several coming up as well. A number of um, other items we do, we are advocating in Annapolis. We are organizing candidate forums. We have three coming up in the spring, as we know that we're entering into our election season for 2022. Very exciting for us here in Maryland. Um, and we support Democratic candidates at every level of government. And coming soon, we will have Representative Jamie Raskin, who will be releasing a new book in January. And we're excited to have him come and speak with our membership. And we have three forums that we will be doing. And they are listed here. Please do uh, mark them on your calendar. Save the date, April 28th. We will have a forum for our, our governor, um, all the candidates for governor. We will have county executive candidates on May 4th and state's attorney on May 12th. So looking forward to being with you at all of those. And those three forums are going to be live forums that are going to be held at the Silver Spring Civic Center. If you would like to ask a question of Jennifer Rubin, please ask in the chat and you can chat to Q&A. And thanks so much to Diana Conway who will be pulling those together and sending them forward so that we can ask those questions of our guest. And without further ado, Jennifer Rubin is a Washington Post columnist since 2010 covering politics and policy in both major political parties and with regard to threats to Western democracy. She is a commentator for MSNBC. She has practiced law for two decades prior to becoming a writer. And she went to University of California at Berkeley um, for her law degree and also undergrad. So thanks so much, Jennifer, for being with us today. And please make note that you can buy her book from, uh, we have here a discount at Politics and Prose, which is a, a longtime partner for us, 10% off. Um, by putting the code SPECIAL10 in at the checkout. And uh, we'll put that up again at the very end as well. But please make sure that you do support independent, um, independent bookstores, women bookstores, Black-owned bookstores um, as much as possible. So very excited to speak with you today, Jennifer, and I'm just going to hand it right over to you. Thanks so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. And um, to a large degree, the book that I completed is really about women like those who are listening to the call. It's about them, for them, and really by them. Um, when I was, like the rest of us, uh, sitting in a stupor on election night on 2016, um, depressed, uh, very shaken, very upset, I never dreamed that we were really on the cusp of what I call a flowering of participatory democracy, largely driven by women. And uh, what the book is really about is looking at women at all levels, 
women who had never been particularly political, women who had never contributed to a campaign or volunteered on a campaign, women who had never run for office, women who had never um, become organizers, do all of those things. And they did them together. They did them by reaching out to friends and neighbors. To some degree, they refreshed and invigorated existing organizations, but they also formed new organizations, networks of women in local communities and nationwide that looked upon the election of Donald Trump as more than just a lost election from a democratic perspective, but a threat to our democracy. And they saw someone who was not only morally unfit, intellectually unfit, but someone who really did not appreciate um, the rules of the road and the guide rails of democracy, respect for the rule of law, respect for an independent judiciary, uh, respect for a free press. And so what I tracked and what I witnessed um, over the next few years really was the story of ordinary American women rising to the occasion. And as I was watching this unfold for a year or so, it struck me that their story, the story of women in particular, was not really being picked up by the mainstream media. When you read stories about the resistance, um, you could easily have gotten the impression that um, women were no different than men. Um, and in fact, they were. When you look at organizations like um, Indivisible, for example, the nationwide organization that formed just in the wake of the election, about three quarters of the people who are participating during the Trump years were women. Uh, it was formed by a husband and wife team, but overwhelmingly women, and overwhelmingly women who had uh, young children, um, mothers who, um, as many of them described to me, looked at their kids and said, how am I ever gonna explain to them what I did during this period unless I do something? And it was that quest um, that began even before the Women's March. Um, as I document in the book, um, there were small groups of women that became large groups of women, that became networks of women, that began forming immediately after the election. And what the March on Washington, the March in Washington, and the hundreds of marches around the country did, was that they gave confirmation to women that they were not alone and that they were not insane, that their conception of America was not a fringe, was not oddball, was not something, a relic of the past, um, but that there were millions of people who shared their deepest concerns. And women, many of them who were in conservative towns and cities and areas, never realized that they had people in their own neighborhood who felt like them. So they were reintroduced to people in their own community, but they also saw a wider movement, a wider uh, population. And if you recall, just the following weekend, right after the inauguration, the Muslim ban went into effect. And what happened? Ordinary citizens went to airports by the hundreds, dozens and dozens of airports. This was not some edict that came down from on high. This was a spontaneous movement, which I think once again reflected this deep abiding concern that something was terribly wrong, something had gone wrong, and that we were in danger of losing something that was uniquely American. This sense that America is an idea, not simply a nationality, certainly not a racial or religious identity. And we saw the mobilization for that. The book then takes us through what, in retrospect, was a remarkable achievement, and that was the fight to save the Affordable Care Act. When you think about it, who would have imagined the day after the election that with the White House, the Senate, and the House in Republican hands, that the ACA would have survived, and as we now know, has been expanded um, and will be expanded even further um, if uh, the Build Back Better um, legislation goes through. Who would have imagined that there would have been a movement sufficient to prevent that from being repealed after seven years or so in which the Republicans were swearing that this was the top priority and they were gonna do everything to pull it out root and branch. Um, what the book looks at is this interesting combination that I think is at the center of politics, particularly democratic politics, 
Um, and that is the coordination between the inside game and the outside game. And what I talk about at some length is the role that the Center for American Progress, which was then led by Neera Tandon, who is now uh, in the White House, um, what she did in terms of organizing the established groups, the interest groups of uh, democratic um, power uh, in Washington, DC, to mobilize them, to get them all on the same page. And combined with the outside game, if you will, largely led by Indivisible, which was demonstrating contacting members in their home districts. That is, members saw people who were their constituents. They didn't get a letter or a form email from somebody across the country. They were confronted with their own members, uh, their own uh, constituents rather. Um, and they were able to mount um, an extraordinary effort to save that, um, which culminated of course in the famous John McCain uh, thumbs down. But the point leading to that was a remarkable effort of political organization, coordination, information sharing, um, that really um, must be, I think, um, a model. And I would hope one of the things we gain um, in retrospect, looking back on this time, and hopefully you would gain from the book, is that that formula applies and should apply to every issue that comes. And the one that I have in mind, of course, is voting rights. The combination of an inside game, people and interest groups willing to cajole and to pressure and to um, see if they can reach the hearts and minds of members, but also an outside movement that is willing to make this very personal for those members and to interact with them in a peaceful, respectful way, a respectful way, um, but very determined, very forceful, um, and really grounded in the districts and the states um, of the members that are key to that vote. So although the book um, is entitled How Women Saved Democracy from Donald Trump, um, the bad news is we aren't done saving it yet. And of course, voting rights and um, really all civil liberties are an ongoing battle uh, made more acute by the fact, of course, that uh, we had January 6th and we have a Republican Party that still refuses to recognize the results of the 2020 election. The book is um, in some ways a tribute to an ode to ordinary citizens. Um, there were a flock of women, if you recall, in 2018, uh, Abigail Spamberger um, being one of them, uh, for example, uh, Mikey Shirell in New Jersey, um, really across the country, um, Elaine Slotkin. These were women who had not been in politics before, really at any level. Many of them had a national security background or a background in um, the military in particular. Um, and they saw that was what was coming. And what they described to me is that the same sense of obligation, a sense of public service that compelled them to join the military, they then sensed in the year um, following uh, Donald Trump's election. And what they saw was that their country needed them. Um, they, many of them went out to interact with their elected leaders. And what they found out was that many of them um, were quite unfit to lead. Many of them were less knowledgeable, less responsible than they were. In the area of national security in particular, these women recognized, wow, I have expertise. I know more than these guys do. And in that moment, they, and I think millions of other women recognized that there was no secret sauce in politics. Politics is not what somebody else does. It's what we all do. And that democracy is not something that is set in stone, but that has to constantly be tended like a garden um, so that from year to year, um, you keep the weeds at bay, you keep the plant alive to carry the metaphor. Um, and it was that experience in 2018 where we saw just a flood of new women candidates. Um, it was because of these women, many of them in swing districts, um, who were able to lift uh, the Democrats back to the majority in the House in 2018, um, and who were then by and large able to hold their seats in 2020. And ironically, um, what happened as a result of that is Republican women then looked around in the wake of 2018 and said, this is a disaster for Republican women. 
look at the imbalance in representation in the Congress between Republican and Democratic women. And they then took a page from the Democrats book. And in 2020, not because the party was interested in organizing, in fact, uh, Kevin McCarthy gave the back of the hand to many women, but among themselves in PACs and organizations, women themselves recruited, raised money, and a record number of, of Republican women ran for the House and were successful. And in a year in which Republicans did better than expected in House races, um, we saw a new class of Republican women. Now, the question, of course, for 2022 will be whether women who marketed themselves as independent of Donald Trump, as reasonable, moderate people, well-designed, well-crafted to the interest of their districts can really hold their seats now that they have been essentially rubber stamps for just about everything Donald Trump uh, has tried to do or tried to do um, and now have been obstructionists in anything that uh, President uh, Biden has tried to do. Um, so the book really kind of looks at all levels and looks at the presidential race as well. Um, and it, I, I think in some ways um, takes a, a harsh view of the media and really kind of the political class in the way that we analyze, the way we look at presidential races. And if you go back in the mental time capsule, it seems so long ago, although it was only about a year or so ago, um, when the candidates um, were announcing for president on the Democratic side, there was a nonstop buzz about finding someone who was safe. It was too risky to let Donald Trump get a second term, and therefore they had to find someone safe. And very soon in the political conversation, in the media coverage, safe became identified with a white male. And when you think about it, when if you ever had one of those posters in your kids' rooms that have all the presidents you know, all in a row, and they're all white men until you get down to the very bottom if you have a, a relatively recent one, and there's a Barack Obama, almost all whites and certainly all men. And what women running for president, including uh, now Vice President Kamala Harris were up against, was this kind of mental conception that we carry around about what a president is, what a president looks like, what a president sounds like. And it was a real uphill battle um, for all of the women, and certainly for a woman of color like Kamala Harris, um, to reach voters and say to them, I'm as safe as the next person, I can win this race. Um, I can uh, convince the country that I am capable of being commander in chief. And again and again, I think they ran up against um, this overriding fear that again, they had to find someone safe. And that was, I think um, in the research I did, the people I talked to in part, um, sort of an unfair um, characterization of what happened in 2016. When people look back on 2016, as you know, it was a very, very close race. Um, a few thousand, tens of thousands of votes in a few states would have made Hillary Clinton president. And there were a million reasons why she didn't win, ranging from James Comey to decisions that the campaign made to uh, a electorate that was really ready for a change as opposed to a status quo election. But the conventional wisdom that came out of that race is America wasn't ready for a woman president. And when you take that into 2020 and you see a party desperate for a safe candidate and you see this national consensus that the reason they lost to Donald Trump was that they ran a woman, you can imagine the uphill climb that the women contenders have. Um, and if you recall, it was at times somewhat comical. You had these women who were exceptionally qualified, I'm referring to the four senators um, who ran, who had years of foreign policy experience, legislative experience, and they were up against people who, like Tom Steyer, had never held office. He was a billionaire. That was his qualification. Michael Bloomberg may have been a good mayor or bad mayor, however you think of it, of New York, but he had never held national office. Um, and, you know, there were um, people like Andrew Yang. Who was he? What, how was he possibly qualified? But for 
men and male candidates traditionally, all they need do is appear on the stage, pronounce themselves ready for leadership, and they are taken seriously. Whereas women candidates have to fight over and over again to identify themselves as both electable, that is qualified, um, resourceful, and also, of course, that uh, very elusive quality of being likable. Um, and that sort of dual um, set of requirements, um, somewhat in contradiction to one another, if you think about it, really, I think, affected the coverage and affected um, the way that the race um, played out. Now, I don't want to say that President Biden um, didn't run a, a disciplined, good primary. He certainly did. Um, and there was certainly objective evidence that in polling, he was the best match for uh, to go up against um, the sitting president. And we also know that the sitting president feared Joe Biden more than anybody else. That's why we got into the second impeachment or the the, uh, the second round of um, impeachable conduct rather um, with Ukraine. So I think what um, we saw was a confluence of events that made it very hard for a woman to become a presidential candidate. But as I look back on 2020 and then looking ahead to the future, I think it was really a breakthrough year, even though there was not a woman uh, nominee. Of course, there was a vice presidential nominee. And seeing her now in positions of authority, seeing her interact with foreign leaders, with the military, will, I think, begin to change how people perceive women in high executive offices. But something else changed as well. And that was when you have a critical mass of women, not just one woman candidate, suddenly it's not the woman, it is a candidate. And the candidates were very different in many respects. Yes, they were all centers, but they had different views on issues. They had different positions. They had different experiences, different strengths, different weaknesses. And suddenly women are treated like male candidates. And that is they're individuals. Of course, they're individuals. Um, and they don't look alike. They don't dress alike. They don't sound alike. And I think just that breakthrough and seeing the expectations about um, a candidate and a field of candidate did shift in 2020. And I would be surprised if we have another presidential election in which there are not women, plural, uh, women um, candidates on uh, at least one, if not both sides. Um, and I think that was a, um, a tipping point in uh, our presidential politics. When we came out of the 2020 election, um, it was certainly one of mixed emotions. On one hand, there was tremendous relief that an enormous um, organizational effort had ousted uh, Donald Trump. Women were at the center of it. Joe Biden enjoyed the largest gender gap in history um, for any presidential candidate. Um, women of color were uh, particularly strong. Uh, women in the suburbs, both white and non-white, turned out in record numbers. Uh, independent women voted heavily for uh, the Democrats and college educated white women voted heavily. But there were of course losses. The house um, was a disappointment and white women still voted for Donald Trump. And so at the end of that election, I was left with um, more questions. And the questions range from, how do you reach women who are outside of those groups now that have gravitated to the Democratic Party? How do you reach rural women? How do you reach non-college educated white women? Um, how do you break through the silos, the information silos, the media bubbles um, that we uh, now find ourselves in order to not simply nourish the Democratic base, but expand it and continue to expand it? And I think one of the things that women candidates, um, I think are better at um, to some regard um, is that they're able to translate politics into issues of culture. Um, and what I mean by that is rather than making something a purely political issue, if you can raise the level to one of personal values, of 
um, interest to people who aren't even political, then you've reached a different realm in which you may be able to have a conversation with someone. This was particularly true when we saw the child separation policy. Democrats and Democratic women did not come out and say, well, here's our 12 point plan for fixing immigration. It was, this is a moral abomination. Um, we cannot as a country be in the business of separating children. This must end. And that message resonated well beyond politics and was in many respects one of the most central issue, issues in getting women to leave the Republican Party, college educated white women in particular, and to mobilize forces. And that experience, I think, in attempting to elevate politics to a statement of values, a statement of who really is the family party, who really is um, the pro-democracy uh, party. I think it is a valuable lesson um, that Democrats sometimes neglect. Um, it is often the case that um, there is a benighted view that really great policies, 16 point plans and detailed legislation is gonna convince voters um, to vote for Democrats. Sometimes that is true, but it is also true that People vote with their hearts and they want to vote with people who they see as um, sharing common values, um, a common outlook on America. And given where the Republican Party has gone over the last um, few years, um, the way I see it from um, a journalistic uh, perspective is that there's a great opportunity um, that there's one party that is doing things to make um, the cost of raising a family cheaper. There is one party that is um, defending work. Um, there is one party that is seeking to protect children in schools um, with uh, reasonable COVID um, uh, measures. And I think the ability to aggregate these various issues and to say, we are the party that is defending the American family. We are the party that is um, really um, living the American ideal that we can all become Americans. That sort of um, shift from a pure list of policy issues to a statement of values is something that I think really um, struck me in the races that many of the women who ran in 2018 uh, did. And in uh, again, in 2020 for many of the uh, Senate and the House seats. So I think if we're looking ahead, um, that is one critical lesson. And of course, many of us um, on this call and many of us in the country um, are very, very concerned about the fate of American democracy. Um, we have seen a Republican party that not only didn't accept the results, but then refused to investigate January 6th. We've seen a party that across the board um, objects to any even debate about voting rights, a party that once upon a time unanimously supported reauthorization of the Voting Rights uh, Act now unanimous, unanimously opposes it. Um, you've seen a party that now lives in the fever swamps of conspiracy um, and uh, just out and out falsehood arise. And you see a party that now celebrates violence, violence against women, violence against Muslims, um, violence against election results they don't like. And these are fundamental threats um, to America. And I think um, when we think ahead to 2022, there are gonna be lots of issues. There's gonna be the economy, there's gonna be inflation, there's gonna be COVID, um, there's gonna be a whole slew of issues. Um, but I think it's critical for Democrats to raise um, the issue that our very democracy, our democratic way of life um, is in peril. And that if we want to avoid the fate of other countries and regions in the world that devolve into violence, that devolve into warring camps. Um, we have to um, re-embrace democracy, the sanctity of elections, the concept that um, of one man, one vote, everyone has access to the vote and every vote is counted fairly and accurately. And I think the ability to not necessarily um, cast an eye backwards, but force, view, uh, force uh, voters 
to look ahead and say, would you trust these people with our democracy going forward is a central issue. Um, do you want chaos in the future? Do you want every election to be an agonizing fight um, with all kinds of crazy fraud theories? And so I think the issue of who is a proper custodian of our democracy is one that is gonna have to be front and center uh, in 2022 and 2024, and perhaps for the foreseeable future. I'm often asked, am I optimistic or am I pessimistic about uh, the future of American democracy? And the answer I give is really not a cop out. It's really sort of what I learned from going on this journey with so many women all over the country. And that is, it depends on us. Um, the chapter hasn't been written. What the Trump era told me and taught me was that democracy is in our hands, that we are masters of our own fate. We are not passive observers in this process. We can only vote, we can organize, we can raise money, um, we can encourage others, we can get out in the public square, we can combat disinformation, we can support groups and individuals who are fighting for voting rights, um, and that this is a ongoing activity um, that um, perhaps I'll do a sequel someday, which would be how women continue to save democracy um, from the Trump legacy, um, because that's what's going to be needed. And um, I think the optimistic view is that we showed we can do it. We now have a roadmap. How do you do this? How do you organize? How do you create a grassroots movement that can sustain um, a presidential election, House elections, Senate elections? Um, but I do worry, and my worry is not that um, the democratic message um, will be unclear, it's that people are fatigued, people are tired. Um, they spent four years fighting uh, against Donald Trump, four years railing at social media, four years railing at disinformation, and then they had COVID. And for many women in particular, um, this has been a nightmare period of time in which they've had to juggle child raising, um, education, careers, family. Um, and both anecdotally and statistically, we know that women have borne the brunt of this, um, that it's women who have had careers interrupted or short circuited, um, that in what has got to be my favorite poll um, done by Pew, uh, men and women were both asked um, who had um, done, who had shared the responsibility of running the household during COVID. And men overwhelmingly said, oh, it's very even. And women overwhelmingly said, no, it's not, we've been doing it. So I think um, while somewhat amusing, it's also telling that in these times of crises, um, women are often uh, getting the short end of the stick. And they're tired. Um, and we have um, left ourselves stressed out. Many of our kids are stressed out. We have a mental health epidemic in this country that has gotten worse during COVID that is still not addressed. And so there are a lot of challenges. Um, and what I would say to all of you is that you've already done the first step, um, which is you're on this call, you're part of a larger community. And now I think the question is, um, can you rededicate yourself? Can you reinvigorate yourself? And once more, I champion democracy um, and defend it against illiberal um, reactionary forces that would undermine not simply the agenda items that um, all of you are seeking to promote, but really democracy itself. So I think I'll stop there and I would love to have questions from all of you. I think I'm gonna get some help from people in collating the questions and putting them together. So go Perfect. ahead. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We, we do have a lot of questions. So we'll, we'll jump, just jump right in. Um, before I do that, I do want to make mention that we have a few different um, elected folks in the, in the audience here. We have Joan Kleinman for Senator Van Hollen. We have Marley Pasternak for Senator Cardin, uh, Marcy Frosch for Attorney General Brian Frosch, 
and Lisa Fuller for Linda Foley, who's the chair of the Montgomery County Democratic Party. If I missed anyone, just please uh, message me and we'll be sure to recognize you. So the first question we have is, if you could talk about the distinctions among women uh, across race. So we know women, especially black women were vital to several races like Senator Warnick in, in Georgia. And we, saw, we just saw white women swing in Virginia to Glenn Youngkin. Um, and we actually have a, a number of questions about that Virginia race, but what are your thoughts there? You just mentioned it a minute ago, um, yeah. but if you could just go into that in a bit more depth. Um, women are complicated people, um, and there are many factors which go into determining political identity. There is race, there is religion, there is geography, and there is education. And all of those factors play a very substantial role in voting patterns. And what we've seen as the Republican Party has migrated further and further from, frankly, a normal political party and has turned into a very reactionary movement is that there is less and less available room um, in the middle and very little um, energy, frankly, put into persuading. We've turned into base elections where both sides try to just turn out as many of their own people. Um, and they've sort of given up, if you will, because we've become, as the saying goes, so polarized. Um, there are, I think, instances in which you can combat that. But I think it takes an awareness of how easy it is for people to forget the past and how easy it is for a candidate simply through lack of a track record and through some personality um, advantages um, to come across as entirely reasonable, to come across as entirely um, you know, within the mainstream of a political party or a state. And what Youngkin did successfully was to walk this line, sort of a maybe it was a zigzag is the better um, metaphor, so that he could wink and nod at the Trump forces and say, I'm with you. I understand, you know, we didn't really lose that election in 2020. And at the same time, pivot and posit himself to particularly suburban women, which I think you reference, um, and come across as sort of a candidate in the old mode of um, kind of moderate Republicans. Um, and we do have some very good moderate uh, Republicans. Um, I can say that. Um, you look at Charlie uh, Baker in Massachusetts. Um, you he was at your choice. Larry Hogan has governed more or less as a moderate. Um, you look at New England, uh, Chris Sununu uh, in New Hampshire. And that was the mode that he kind of slotted himself into. See how normal I am. See how able I am to deal with your problems. And I think unless you're really prepared for that and really prepared to push back on an attempt to disguise the agenda, the Republicans aren't going to be successful. And I think this is one way when we're talking a little bit about values is that Democrats have to do a better job. Um, the fact that he was able to take over the education issue from Democrats is really unbelievable to me. Um, in Virginia, where I lived for about 15 years, Republicans were not in favor of funding the schools. Republicans were not in favor of supporting teachers. Republicans um, still are not in favor of teaching um, a well-rounded education. Um, and for Democrats allow, to allow the Republicans to abscond with that issue is really to disarm themselves. And I think going forward, um, both in very specific ways, but also in general ways, they really have to recapture these issues that do appeal to many um, moderate suburban women. Um, they have to reinforce the notion that they are the party of education. They are the party of working families. They are the party that cares about an education. And I would throw out just one suggestion, which I think is just ripe for the picking for Democrats. And that is to champion the issue of civics education. We badly need it. And it is in some ways a response to the Trump years. Republicans don't want that. They wanna teach some bizarro version of American history that leaves out all the bad parts um, or leaves out all the challenges that we've overcome. Um, and Democrats um, should be, of course, in favor of a 
full, complete um, teaching of American history, but also one of civic education, mandatory civic education for every kid who graduates from high school. And that's the sort of issue that I think that puts Republicans on the defensive. They don't want people learning that much about democracy. They don't want people going back to the Constitution these days. Um, they want to talk about America as a white Christian nation. They want to talk about Western civilization being lost to these um, intruders, these foreigners. Um, and I think for Democrats to recapture these issues, both in rhetoric, but also in policy, is going to take um, some real thought and some real deliberate action. And I think helping candidates think through these issues um, is one thing that all of you can certainly do. And you, in your own neighborhoods, your own communities, your own schools, know the issues that are near and dear. And I think it has to be a, a communication, a two-way street. I think Democratic politicians need to listen to their engaged voters, and they need to see what are the sorts of things that they need to talk more about. What would have made some of those women um, turn or return to the Democratic Party rather than to vote uh, for someone like Youngkin? Um, so hopefully um, 2021 will be a learning experience for Democrats um, that they will pick up something from that. Um, but I come back to the main message that it has to be one of values and one of um, saying to the average voter that if you care about America, if you care about families, if you care about security, then we're the party for you. And that message um, sometimes gets distorted, sometimes gets overridden by all kinds of crazy themes that Republicans will throw up against the wall. But it's up to Democrats to bring it back to that very central message and return again and again. Um, so the next question is, how do you how do you fight back and against a party that just will blatantly lie, that pushes that that pushes disinformation or at least does not fight up fight against it actively and just allows that to grow and grow? How do we do that? It's a very difficult problem. And it's a difficult problem because many people in the Trumpian world do not read regular newspapers or listen to mainstream media. They spend their lives in a very controlled media environment in which Fox and some right-wing talk show hosts and some websites are their sole source of information. And so they have a very skewed vision of reality. And I think it's, and it's a difficult task. Um, and I think there are a few things that um, we all can do. And one is that our elected leaders, when they do have the bully pulpit, need to say it. They need to put it out there. Um, and they need to say, listen, Republicans are endangering your children. We know vaccines work. Look at the death rates in states in which governors have resisted. Um, and thrown up all sorts of disinformation and look at the death rates in states where people have been responsible. It has to be that blatant, it has to be that direct because the president still does have the bully pulpit and elected leaders still do have um, the ability to um, aggregate eyeballs and um, our attention span. And so I think one thing that has to be done is that when elected leaders do have the forum, they have to be very clear that, about what is going on. They have to call a lie a lie. It's not misinformation. It's not distortion. It's not exaggeration. It's a lie. It's a lie. And they have to hit that over and over again. And I think they also have to cultivate what is still there, which is some common sense um, that, you know, look around. We have 700,000 Americans who have died. Um, look at the people who have gotten vaccinated, a number of those people who have died, and look at the number of people who are unvaccinated and look at those people. You have to kind of return to some kind of common sense um, that will hopefully be able to, you know, break through the, the chatter. And I actually look at climate control as um, a somewhat um, happy story here. Um, there are a lot of Republican elected officials now who will talk about um, a transfer to green energy or mitigation against extreme weather. So there are things <clears throat> that because they are so overpowering, 
droughts and floods in the Midwest, the erosion of the Carolina coastline, that um, these people really cannot ignore. That if you back up and make the argument about something concrete in these people's lives, they'll be more willing to listen to you than if you say, you know, you guys are just wrong, it's not a hoax. Um, we're right, you're wrong. Um, and if you move then to, all right, how are we gonna keep, you know, the coastline from going underwater? Or how do we, what, what's the best way to mitigate against, um, you know, what is now um, these uh, gargantuan hurricanes? They make it practical, you make it specific to them, then perhaps you have a chance to, to break through. But I also think that we should be clear-eyed that some of the detoxification, the deprogramming, frankly, is going to have to come within those communities. It's going to have to come in evangelical churches. It's going to have to come within the Republican Party. And um, it's not at all uh, obvious to me that that's happening yet. Um, one way you encourage them to have a conversation is to beat them in elections. Um, and that is certainly um, sometimes the, the key to self-reflection. Um, but I think it's, uh, it is a huge problem. And I think um, we should all remember that in whatever way that we are, um, we are messengers for our political views in our community, in our schools and elsewhere. And um, I think we can't give up on our fellow Americans. We can't give up on our neighbors, our um, friends, our relatives, um, and that we have to look for openings where we can find them and find ways in which we can um, reach them on things that they really care about. Um, and that's the challenge, I think, for Democrats um, in the years ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, here's another. Many of the grassroots groups that were born after the 2016 election were organized and largely populated by college educated white women of a certain age, um, a reflection of our privilege. Many of us have struggled to engage women of color, younger people, and men in our work. While grassroots groups organized by people of color and youth have blossomed in many locations, we still often find ourselves siloed, which reduces our effectiveness. Have you observed any groups that have successfully navigated this divide? And what lessons might we learn from them? Uh, I tell, actually, yes. And I tell the story of um, a uh, woman who led an indivisible group in Alabama. And what she did, this was in the Doug Jones 2017, if you remember, Senate race, the seat was opened up because um, the attorney general uh, vacated that seat. Um, and um, what she did was she teamed up with not only the NAACP, but the um, historic black colleges and universities in Alabama. And she made a partnership. And what they did was they committed to go out together um, to door knock, to register students, where it was very difficult because Alabama makes it very hard for students to register to vote in their own districts. And they made an alliance. And that was to me the perfect example of how you have to kind of build the bridges. And you have to think about it hard enough and do it very deliberately. And so if you are in, for example, an indivisible group and you look around and 90% of the people are African-American, what other groups are active in your area? What other groups can you do outreach with? Um, and some groups, um, there is an organization called One America. And what they do has been matching up churches, an evangelical church of mostly conservatives from a rural place and a progressive community from another place, perhaps a reformed Jewish synagogue, for example. And they have put them together so that they can team up for um, public good for uh, projects in the community. And they may not even be political, but what they're doing is they're building some bridges. And I think we can all look for those opportunities. Um, I saw in my own community, the Jewish community in uh, Northern Virginia, um, when we had the horrendous shooting in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life Synagogue, there was a tremendous effort from the Muslim community to reach out to the Jewish community. And that to me was a perfect model for what we have to do on a consistent basis. So I think it falls on all of the organizations um, to reach across that divine, to 
find people um, who have a wider audience, a bigger perspective, and to team up to, you know, create some joint projects, to create um, some joint organizing activities, so that even if they still may have their own groups, and hopefully we'll have groups that are more uh, mixed, um, you'll at least um, be able to put those forces together, and there is a synergy that gets generated. And I also look to the work that Stacey Abrams did in and is doing in Georgia. She went out to white rural Georgia and she went knocking on doors and people there had never been approached. No one had ever paid attention to them. And what she was able to do was communicate to them that their interest, which in this case happened to be the complete absence of rural healthcare, was exactly the same as um, urban areas, um, urban poor women, for example, um, who did not have access to decent healthcare. And so by making the effort to go where you have not been before um, and to reach people, you will find some commonality. And then the, the challenge is then to keep that going and to maintain that kind of relationship um, day in and day out. Um, so it's a great question. It is absolutely essential. And I do worry that once more younger voters um, are sort of becoming disillusioned or kind of retreating back. Um, and they are one of the most, if not the most important group, because frankly, they're so large. Um, and the millennial generation, the generation below them, um, are soon going to be the majority of the electorate. Um, and unless they are cultivated, unless they are engaged, um, we're going to lose that opportunity for a whole generation of young people, which is going to be absolutely critical in our politics. Um, we have a, two questions uh, sort of around um, grassroots support. So how can women convince the DNC, the DCCC, the DSC, to put more effort into building grassroots support like what Stacey Abrams was able to do at the state level rather than just, well, people just feel like they're getting you know, hit for, for money all the time, but where is that, how can we get that money to go in, those, in that direction essentially? Right. Um, it's a great question because as we are learning in the redistricting process, what happens at the state level is really, really important. First of all, states are important anyway, um, as we've learned during COVID and all of our other crises. Most of the decisions that affect your daily life, um, frankly, are state and local decisions. Um, and so uh, I think the first thing is to go out to existing groups and to have them um, not devote themselves entirely to national politics to go out to the indivisible groups, to go out to groups that have already formed in the, uh, the Trump era and encourage them to become involved. I hold up as a great example, um, a group called the Liberal Women of Chesterfield County, who uh, grew from a gaggle of about 60 people to several thousand. Uh, they operate in Chesterfield County, which many of you know, is um, sort of the suburban areas around Richmond, does not include Richmond, but has some areas that um, are at times rather conservative um, or moderate. And that was the area, one of the areas in which uh, Abigail Spamberger won. And what these women did in the wake of the 2016 um, debacle is they got themselves organized and they started recruiting candidates to run in every single state and local election. There were years in which there were no Democratic candidates on the ballot for many of these offices. And so what they did is they made themselves a force to be reckoned with. Um, they recruited candidates. They had candidates come through to try to get their endorsement. And once you have a critical mass of people, once you have even a thousand people, 2000 people, it doesn't take tens of thousands of people, um, then you can be a force. Because as we know, unfortunately, in state and local elections, the electorate is smaller. And that means an active group has a bigger influence. So I would encourage people who are involved in national organizations um, to go find the people who have um, already become engaged, who already have organized themselves um, and give them an opening, give them a reason um, to re-engage in state and local politics as well. Um, and 
there are models like um, the liberal women of Chesterfield County. I would encourage you to have one of them, by the way. I, they, I talk about them a lot in the book and they are a great role model for exactly what you're talking about, for how to motivate people to run in these races, how to get them elected, and then how to make themselves into power brokers um, by having candidates come through to seek their uh, nominations. So there are some great examples out there but it is absolutely the case um, that 2022, of course, we're going to have Senate and House races, but we're going to have a slew, about 35 governor races. In many states, um, state legislatures are all going to be up for review. We have important ballot initiatives in many states um, that um, affect our lives. So um, I think a renewed emphasis on those state and local elections is exactly the right direction to be going in right now. So I have just a few more, we have just a few minutes and we have a few more questions. So if you wanna just give a, a very quick response sure. to some of these quick questions, we'll, we'll try to get them through with that. Um, so one question is, you know, how do we essentially get rid of the electoral college? I'm just gonna, <laughs> it's a long question, but really how do we do that? I mean, there's yeah. the national there popular a vote compact, there's a lot of different, how do we do right. it? Yeah, it's the National Voter Compact that I think is really the only way. Um, we're not going to get a constitutional amendment because that's uh, virtually impossible. And actually, they've been making some progress. Um, I think it's coming on uh, up in uh, now Colorado. This, of course, is the agreement among states it has to be passed through a state legislature that they will award their electoral uh, votes to the national public, um, uh, national popular vote winner. And as soon as you get to 270 votes, then you have effectively a um, an election that's driven by the national popular vote. And so if it hasn't been passed in a state, um, I would encourage people to organize and to make that a central issue um, and to support um, the groups that are working on this in other states. And uh, to my surprise, I was talking to someone who was heavily involved in this um, just a couple of weeks ago, and they are optimistic about making some progress in eventual uh, in some of these states. So go on, you can just Google National Voter Compact or National Vote Compact, and uh, you will see their website pop up and you can kind of learn what their activities are. Um, and then another is in terms of um, what Republicans are doing in terms of infrastructure and laws and regulations, we know they packed the courts. Um, in 2022 and 2024, you know, how can we overcome the historical trends and, and essentially prevail here? We're, we're, people are very worried that we're going to lose both elections and, um, and that we're not going to have the support structures to make sure that we have fair elections. One thing I would say is that people have got to stop with this negativity, with this sense of fatalism. That is just death and it's ridiculous. It's what the press thrives on. They would like us to have us believe that Kevin McCarthy is already Speaker of the House. It's nonsense. We are a year away. It's gonna be determined in large part by the economy and by where COVID is. And if Republicans have voted against everything from infrastructure to childcare to uh, keeping the government open and uh, preventing a default, Democrats are going to have plenty to run on. So the first thing I would say is stop with the fatalism, stop with the we've already lost this and go out, recruit quality candidates and start running on those issues. Republicans are going to have a miserable record and they're not going to be able to play the Youngkin game in many instances because they've been voting. Youngkin could pull off Youngkin because no one knew who he was. He had no voting record. He never held public office. And so he could present himself as this nice, amiable guy in the little, you know, vest. Um, and everyone thought he was a nice guy. These people have a voting record and they should be tied to it. And frankly, Republicans are a lot better than Democrats. Democrats have to tie these people to the people that they support and enable. That's the Marjorie Taylor Greens. That's the Lauren Pobbitts. These people are extremist nuts and the rest of the party supports them and defends them. And Republicans are great at being making somebody on the Democratic side the poster child for the Democratic Party. Democrats have to make these people the poster child and it's entirely fair because they're entirely enabled, supported, defended by everybody in that party. 
So I think a combination of um, making the opposition to things people like and uh, making sure people understand how extreme and crazy these people are gives Democrats a lot to work with. Um, so no more negativity, no more fatalism. Get out there, start recruiting candidates, make the message. Excellent. I, I, we're just about at time, but I want to read um, just something from a, an opinion piece that you had just written. Um, if Republicans wanted something different for their party, they would demand it. If they wanted to return to a, quote, normal party with minimal standards of conduct, it would have happened long ago. They have facilitated the transformation of the GOP into a dumpster fire party. It's up to the rest of the country to douse the flames lit by the former arsonist in chief. I thought that was so very well written and really Thank just you. to the point. Thank you so much, Jennifer, My for pleasure. being with us today. We really appreciate your time. We're getting, we're getting uh, claps from I can see in the audience <laughs> there. So very much. Thank and if you. If you would like to purchase Jennifer's book, I'm going to ask um, Scott if you could bring that back up again so that people can see how to purchase her book. Um, here we go. If you would like to go to Politics and Prose, you can have a 10% discount there with the code SPECIAL10. To purchase her book, Resistance, How Women Save Democracy from Donald Trump. Jennifer Rubin, thank you again. And thanks to everyone so much for your time today. We look forward to seeing you very soon for uh, an upcoming session with Jamie Raskin in January and at our spring forums. We're going to have a lot of other programs as well and some community education panels too. So stay tuned. Um, and thanks again for being with us today.